Uh, so, welcome to this uh, webinar about the EPD process, everybody. Uh, it's currently here in Sweden, uh, 10 a.m., and we are due to start right now. So, welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, so, the schedule is as following. First of all, we have Danielle Crowder Elving from the EPD Secretariat, which will give an overview of the EPD. What is it and how is it made? We will then proceed to explaining the LCA process, what is a life cycle assessment, which Nile Elgenoskanat, LCA expert at the IVL Swedish Environmental Research Institute, will explain. And lastly, we will go on to uh, EPDs for an organization. How can EPD be used for a business? Uh, that part will be led by Dr. Nasser Ayub, Managing Director of EPD Mina. And lastly, we will have a Q&A session, live Q&A session in the end. If you have any questions during the webinar, you have a Q&A function in the top right corner, which you can ask questions, which we will answer throughout the webinar. Uh, all questions are moderated and we will answer them uh, as quickly as we can. If there are no further questions, we will then start off with Danielle, who will start off the webinar. Danielle, take it on. Yes, thank you, Julia. Let me just prepare everything. Right. Okay. Hello everyone and welcome to this first webinar of the year with EPD International. Um, so my name is Danielle and I work in the support and finance in EPD International and I will be presenting this first part of the webinar. Uh, I will be going for just in general the what an EPD is and how it is created. Um, to begin with, I would just like to introduce the company EPD International. We are a global EPD program operator. Um, and we also we try to represent globally and we have help of licensees in regional markets around the world. Um, we also have the largest PCR library on the market, uh, so-called product category rules. Um, and we work on broadening this library all the time as well. Um, we also put down a lot of work on global harmonization in an attempt to make EPDs available for everyone globally around the world. And that's a bit about us. So, what is an EPD? Um, an EPD is also called a type three product product declaration. Um, the purpose of an EPD is to be able to present environmental data in a transparent, transparent and public way. Um, and the aim is for the data to be comparable between products. Uh, and also the third party verification makes the data trustworthy. Um, yes. EPDs follow some international standards. Uh, so we follow international standards and this pyramid represents the baselines for the EPD. So at the bottom we have some ISO numbers which are quite broad and then ISO 14025 is the specific EPD uh, international standard. Um, also we have our general program instruction which is our internal guidelines and it is a mandatory uh, part if you are a program operator such as EPD International. Um, we work with our product category rules which are product specific rules and guidelines on how the EPD should be created depending on the product and they can be complemented, uh, complemented with a CPCR. Um, we also work with in 15804 or the ISO standards 21930 and these are construction based which is of course 
a big sector in EPDs currently. Um, so just a bit about what can be found in an EPD. Um, first of all, you can always find information about the product owner, so the company who owns the EPD. Secondly, you'll have product information, such as what are the inputs and in, uh, raw materials that go into the product, uh, how is the product produced, which electricity is used, what transportation methods are used, and so on. Also, the end of life, life process is declared. Um, so the end of life scenario, such as if the product is recycled or if it goes to landfill. Uh, and then also additional information such as social and economic impacts can also be included. Um, the environmental impacts are declared in these performance indicators, um, and this is just a representation of some of the indicators that can be declared. Uh, the PCR decides which indicators should be used in each EPD, so it depends on the product. Additionally, the EPD should also present the program operator, which in this case would be EPD International. Um, the verifier, so the person or company who has verified the data in the EPD. Also, it should be declared if you have used an LCA consultant uh, who this was or which company. It should also be clear where the data sources came from, so where the data was collected. Um, so there are five general steps of creating an EPD. Um, I will go through each of the five steps more closely, but just to present in the beginning. The first step is to select which PCR needs to be used for your product. The second step and the largest step, I would say, is the life cycle assessment. Uh, thirdly, you should format the EPD or create the document that will be the end product. And the fourth step is the verification step. And last but not least, you should register the EPD with the program operator and it will be published once everything is okay. So, to the product category rules. This is the first step in creating an EPD. You should define what is your product and is there a product category rule which matches your product? Uh, there are a lot of PCRs in our library and this is just a small representation of some of them that can be found. You can create an EPD for any product or service. So some examples here are vegetables, waste management systems, uh, bridges, yarns, wine, baked goods, construction products, and so on. So the list is long already. However, if you cannot find a PCR which matches your product, you are also very welcome to contact us and we are always open to developing new PCRs for new products on the market. Uh, and this is a process which uh, anyone can engage in who is interested, such as stakeholders. Um, also, I just want to mention this UNCPC code, the central product classification. If you know this code for your product, it can also assist you a lot in finding the correct PCR. Uh, and at the bottom right here, we also have the email address to my colleagues in the PCR team. So if you have any questions, you can always email them and they will respond to you. Right, so the life cycle assessment. Um, I will not be going into this too much because my colleague Neelai will be presenting this after me. Um, but just to present it quickly, this is the largest part of the EPD creation. It can take from six months up to a year uh, and it should end in a LCA report, which is what should be one of the things that should be verified by the verifier. Right, step three, the EPD format. Um, the rules on what should be included in an EPD are defined in section nine of our general program instruction. So if you wish to read that more closely, you're welcome. 
uh, we also have templates available on our website. These are optional, uh, but they can serve as a good guideline for what uh, the EPD can look like and what should be included. Um, so for languages, the EPD has to be available to some extent in English. There are really two options how you can publish EPDs in different languages. Either you can publish the original EPD in English and then publish as many translated versions as you want. The second option is that you can publish in any other language, but there should always be an English summary in this case. And then also just a side note that the PDF should be no larger than 10 megabytes. OK, step four, the verification. Um, there are two types of verifiers that can perform verification, either an individual verifier or an accredited certification body. Um, the, both the verifiers and certification bodies are listed on our website, so you can find the ones that are approved by us to perform EPD verification. Um, yes. And the certification body is a larger company who performs uh, verifications while well, the individual verifier is an, uh, an individual person. So that's the difference there. We also have two more options that can ease the process uh, of creating EPDs, and especially if you're a company planning to produce a lot of EPDs. The first one is process certification. This can be accredited to a company body. So the right option here. Um, this enables a company to publish EPDs without having them verified by a verifier in the system. So you get your um, process accredited and then you can publish EPDs and it can ease the process. Um, the second option is the pre-verified tool. Uh, a pre-verified tool needs to be approved by us. The tool contains data and calcula calculation models, which can make the LCA and EPD process a little simpler. Yeah. Also, I would like to recommend you to contact verifiers in time because they are busy people often, so it's always good to get in touch with them early. Uh, and at the bottom right here, you also have the email to my colleague who works with compliance and also with the verifiers in our system if you have any questions about this. Uh, so the last and final step is the registration and publication. This is a summary of the documents that should be uh, submitted. So we have the EPD documents in a PDF format. And you should also submit the verification report from your verifier and also the verification dialog if available. Um, if you are publishing an EPD in the construction sector, you should also uh, uh, submit this LCA results in an L Excel template. And this Excel template can be found on our website as well. Uh, so where to submit your EPD? Uh, this depends a bit on your region. If you are in a hub region or in one of our licensee regions, then you should contact them first, and I will also present them in the next slide. If you are in any other region, you should use our EPD portal, and that's where you submit the EPD. The final review is made by the Secretariat, so that's us, me and my colleagues and the support, and we will contact you if there is anything missing, and otherwise the EPD should be published within one to three days. And you also have our email at the bottom right if you have any more questions about this. So finally, I would just like to present the licensees. If you are in any region that is marked green on this map, then you are part of a regional hub and then you can contact any of these. Uh, and you can find the contact details of all of these on our website. Yeah. And that was just about it for me. I will I stop, stop here, here in case okay, anyone has any questions. questions. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you so much, Danielle. We have a lot of questions uh, in the chat and in the um, Q&A, so we will get to them as soon as possible. Um, so thank you everybody for the, all of the questions. We will get to you as quickly as we can. Um, so now from here we have the LCA part, uh, the LCA assessment. So Neelay, uh, here are you ready for your presentation? Let me share my screen. Here we go, I think. Yeah, thank you. Here we go. So, uh, my name is Nilay and I'm working at IVL uh, in the life cycle management group, working mostly on life cycle assessment and some social life cycle assessment. Uh, it's a it might be a long story, uh, but I will try to make it as short as possible. What is life cycle assessment and how we conduct it? Uh, you can consider this as a summary. So the main idea is to uh, evaluate environmental performance or of your product, and it should be from a life cycle perspective. It can answer some questions like what is best for the environment in your daily life. For example, shall I use paper bags or shall I use plastic bags or shall I use textile bags or shall I use the towels to dry my hands or electric hand dryers? And you can make a long list like that. And LCA can answer all these questions. And where we use this, uh, product enhancement, product comparison, and if you want to make a new product which is environmentally friendly, you can also involve it in the design phase, or you want to waste, uh, minimize your waste, or for product labeling, where we are generally talking about it now. I will ask a quick questions. But I won't give the answer. It's just uh, something to think about. If you have this question, like, which is more environmentally friendly? For example, if you compare single use diapers with reusable or washable diapers, we can answer this question, for example, with LCA. And when we talk about life cycle, uh, maybe we should think about what is a life cycle of a product. For example, if it's a chair, the life cycle starts from the forestry. So when you consider life cycle assessment, you have to include all the environmental impacts coming from forestry industry. And then you produce the chair, but at some point it is broken. Maybe you give it to municipality uh, as a wood waste or you burn it in your fireplace. So this is the life cycle of a chair. And in this uh, approach, you have to uh, consider all the life cycle phases. The first phase is the raw materials extraction and then the manufacturing. And it might be packaging and distribution, using, reusing in between. And sometimes we even start from cradle and go back to cradle as you see in the picture on the left, or you might finish at the gate, or uh, you might choose some part of this life cycle. On the right, you can see that uh, you translate your production into a model. So there are extraction processes, and then there is transport, and the transport might be different transportation styles. And then you have the manufacturing process and the use process you might include. And then we have the waste treatment processes. If you consider energy production, for example, it is a little bit different because then you don't think about the life cycle of the energy. So you don't consider how you use the energy. But then you have to consider, the, for example, for this one in, in a wind farm, 
you have the manufacturing processes, the steel and electric, uh, electrical parts, electronic parts, and then you do the installation in the offshore, for example, in this picture. And then you have this operation and maintenance stage where you produce the electricity. And then you have the decommissioning stage. So we use these two standards uh, for life cycle assessment. And they are translated to many languages and they are quite straightforward if you want to follow. Excuse me, but the slides are not showing anymore. Oh, okay. Now? Yes. See you again. Do we, where do we lost it? Here? This we saw, and I think the next one as well. Okay. No, no, the where the, the there was the tree, not this. Ah. Okay. So that, this is the this we saw, of yeah. the chair. Okay. And this is what I was talking about when uh, considering life cycle stages and translating it into a model. On the left, you see the life cycle stages, but then you have to translate it into a model to make the life cycle assessment model where we most use a software and a database. And here you can see the life cycle of a wind farm. And these are the standards that we use for life cycle assessment. In the life cycle assessment standard, the, there is a concept that we have to understand before doing life cycle assessment, which is unit process. So for all everything, like all the production steps or all the end of life steps, you can make a flow chart. And in this flow chart, you divide everything into unit processes. And in each unit process, you will have an input and then output and also intermediate flows. And then you connect all these unit processes. So what is going in? is like mass, energy, how much energy you use, and the emissions uh, and the waste. And you can have products and co-products. And everything is based on this unit process concept. SCA methodology has four phases, and these are iterative phases. The first one is goal and scope. Then life cycle inventory comes impact assessment, and then we have the interpretation. But as you can see, the flows are in between. So when you this define goal and scope, and then you make your calculations in the impact assessment, you can go to interpretation and think about your goal and scope again. Was it too little? Do I have to extend my goal and scope part or for example, this part is totally unnecessary. Maybe I should cut off this part. So you go back and forth. Like you can go to life cycle inventory and you need to collect more data related to your production steps. And then you do the impact assessment again. In the definition of goal and scope phase, what we do is to make a system boundary. How far should I go? Where is my system boundary? Where am I? Like, where am I producing this? What is the geographical and time limits? And what is the purpose of my study? For example, do I want to compare my product with some other product, my former product? What do I want to do with these results? Do I want to show how environmentally friendly my production is? This might be all different kind of uh, goals in a life cycle assessment study. And then we have to decide the functional unit, which is maybe one of the other most important terms in the life cycle assessment terminology. Functional unit is what you are doing with your product, what your product does, let's say. For example, it might be very straightforward when you produce energy, your functional unit is most of the time one kilowatt hour of energy. But when you are producing paint, for example, it might be more complicated. For example, how much uh, 
wall area I can produce for how long. And other others might be even more complicated when you have different functions in one uh, in one product. For example, as a phone is now has to do lots of things, reading emails, talking, maybe is the little that we do now. So we have to decide what is our functional unit. And then in the lifecycle inventory part, we create a flowchart that connects these unit processes that I was telling you. And for each unit process in our flowchart, we have to uh, count the inputs and outputs. And in this calculation, what we do is that we calculate everything for our functional unit. So if our product is one chair, for example, that we can use for 10 years, then for this chair, how much input is got, uh, needed and how much waste we are producing in between. So this is the uh, life cycle inventory part where we count everything. In the life cycle impact assessment, uh, we translate our inputs and outputs into uh, emissions. So everything we do has some emissions, but it's not just what we do in our production factory, for example, but we have to also consider the electricity we use. So when we produce, the, when we not us, but when the electricity is produced, then there are emissions related to, to that. So we have lots of emissions, and if we just list all the emissions, it will be very hard to interpret, and it will be very hard to show this to people. So what we do is the classification part, and then we have the characterization and weighing parts. This classification and characterization parts are necessary for all uh, life cycle assessment studies. The weighting part is not necessary, but it is optional. It is uh, in the characterization stage, you have this life cycle impact categories. So this list goes like this. It's just a, a part of this, and the emissions are much more than this. So you classify this. Uh, emissions into impact categories and then you in different impact assessment methods you have like 10 11 9 and impact categories and then you can choose but your target audience maybe can't understand these different impact uh, categories so maybe you need to wait and give one point to everything which makes comparisons easier and then the last step is the life cycle interpretation, where we talk about what we found. For example, from which part of the production stage we have uh, most of the impacts. And then when you find out where it comes from, the impacts, then you can make some uh, revisions in your product processes, and then you can decrease that impacts. Or if you consider that you can do waste disposal in two ways, and if one way of waste disposal it has lots of environmental impacts, then you can choose the other one. And then you need this report for communication of the results, which we call this part life cycle interpretation. And from me, that's all. Thank you very much, Nile, uh, for that presentation on the LCA assessment. Um, if you have any questions directly to Nile, you can also continue to posting them in the chat. We'll answer them as quickly as possible. Any questions directly to Nile at this point? Yes. Can you? Sorry, <laughs> if I can't pronounce this. Yes, you had a question. Yes, hello. I can you hear me? Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry if I can't hear you. I can hear. Oh. oh. So, 
uh, I will ask my answer, my question. Uh, so I was wondering uh, what is relevant to follow, which uh, standards is it relevant to follow uh, between the ISO uh, 14040 or the EN 15804? 14040 uh, is like the general, the head of the standards in the mm -hmm. life cycle assessment. So the others are more specific, but uh, it's the first thing you follow and you have to follow 14040. Okay, and all the impacts uh, measured uh, in the EN uh, have, have to be in the report. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, I mean, uh, in the EN standard, uh, you have some uh, specific impacts to measure uh, that are not uh, in the ISO standards. And uh, I was wondering if uh, you can, uh, at, the, at the end of the study, if you can show other relevant impacts that are not uh, specifically in the EN standards. Mm, I, I think it's according to how you make your report. For example, for a general life cycle assessment report, you can choose the impact categories you want to publish. But if you are following another standard, then you have to, I think, consider that one. Okay, so for an, an EPD, you have to follow the EN uh, impacts. For EPD questions, I think I'm not the right person. I am a okay. general <laughs> LCA person. <laughs> but we okay. maybe have someone here. Yeah, Gustav. I can compliment here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm Gustav Sandin. I'm the PCR manager of EPD International. Uh, so yes, uh, if you do a, a construction product EPD and most other EPDs as well, you have to declare the impact categories stated in EM15804. But yes, you can declare additional indicators as well. Uh, for example, there are specific markers like in North America that expect the tracy impact categories, which you can expect mm -hmm. uh, you can declare in addition to the in 15 indicators. So there's some flexibility and some options to declare additional impact categories. Yes. Okay. Even even if it is not a um, construction product. Uh, yes, uh, uh, our our new PCRs developed. They have the same uh, core mandatory impact categories as in 1584, uh, but some PCRs uh, mandate additional indicators that are relevant for the product category. Uh, but regardless of the mandated indicators, you can also add additional indicators if they are relevant, uh, and if if the verifier if the, the method used uh, is of sufficient scientific quality, which is verified by the verifier. But there are there is flexibility to add additional indicators, sometimes specified in the PCR and sometimes on an EPD per EPD basis. You can add as well. Hope that answers. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, let's do, uh, I think we have Parisa and Arina, and then I think we have to continue with um, our next presenter, but please, Parisa and Arina, if you have additional questions. Yes, thank you very much for this interesting webinar. I just have a question regarding mutual uh, recognition between IES and other program operators. If we publish a PPD under IES, would it be make the process easier or faster to publish under other program operators like IBU or FDES? Uh, Should I respond as well, Julia? Yeah, I can take that as well. I can take that as well. Uh, yes, we have a mutual recognition agreements with certain program operators. And we have um, so-called so MRAs. MRAs for if we have an um, MRA covering an EPDs, we can do dual registration, and then you can 
if you have registered an EPD in our system, uh, pay the registration fee for another system and have it in both systems and vice versa. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have in my head the updated list of which uh, program operators we have an MRA with at the moment, but you can find the list on our website. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, then so let's see here. Uh, Parisa, you have your hand raised. Uh, thank I you. Uh, yeah, Lauren, last question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we are asked for an EPD for a small house. And the first question if it's uh, there is a practice, can we make an EPD for a small house? And actually, from the chat, uh, I have got the answer that there is a special approach, like building LCA. But still, the question is, if it results in just EPD for a small house, and do you have uh, such a, um, like a practice? Thank you. I can respond there as well. Uh, so if you are... Uh, if, if it's a house, you use the, our main PCR construction product, PCR 201914. Uh, and right now, there is uh, we are developing a complementary PCR, a CPCR, for buildings that you use uh, as well. So use the PCR 201914 and the CPCR for buildings when it has been published in later this year or early next year. Uh, until this has been published, you can use only the main PCR on construction products. Having said this, we also have a, a complementary PCR for uh, for uh, prefabricated uh, buildings, some for special purposes. So depending on a house, we already have another CPCR available. Okay. So yes, it's possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all of the questions. Um, we have we also have a opportunity for more questions at the end of the webinar. But until then, thank you very much, Nile, for your presentation. Bye-bye. Um, uh, now we have Dr. Nasser Ayoub, uh, Managing Director of EPD MENA, one of our latest offices, here to present um, the business side and the organizational strategy for EPDs, uh, which we'll take on now. So thank you, Dr. Nasser, for being here. Uh, and you have the floor. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. And um, actually, Daniel and Nilay made my uh, life easier because they explained uh, every bit of what we should do uh, to develop uh, LCE and um, EPD. And here is the uh, difficult question. So is how to integrate and uh, why to integrate environmental product declaration in our business strategy and uh, what is the benefits of uh, EPD to my organization. So uh, first I would like to start with the uh, what is the business strategy? So uh, it's business strategy according to Harvard Business School is a strategic initiative a company pursue to create value. So the first key point is creating value for the organization and its stakeholders. So creating value for organization and gain a competitive advantage. So this is the main part of the business strategy and the main definition. And to do that, we need to answer several questions. So what is the created value? What is the business create value for customers, for employees and organization, and for uh, our collaborators and stakeholders. So, and and I will use these questions to uh, answer the 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 main the main business strategy question or the main business strategy inclusion of uh, EPD. So, uh, what is EPD? I think uh, uh, Daniel introduced the uh, definition, but again, it is transparent. It is verified, independently verified, that gives it uh, uh, a reputation, that gives it uh, a distinction from other uh, declarations. It is uh, transparent. Uh, as Nilay explained, we uh, LCA considers everything in the 
uh, supply chain of the product and uh, and also it introduces the life cycle impact in a credible way so this is this gives uh, the the strength to the results and to use of uh, use, the use of uh, epd uh, in our business strategy as an organization so from this perspective it creates value for supplier because having uh, environmental impacts uh, of a, a product that considers uh, the extracted material and transportation and everything it has value for the company to reduce environmental impact and to the customer who can who knows how to uh, how this product he is using is performing environmentally so so we we uh, companies strategize to develop epds to communicate this kind of information so it's it is like the nutrition facts so here for food we have how much calories we have how what are the fats so if we want to uh, make diet then we know exactly uh, which food we should uh, we should eat it's exactly here as environmental uh, product declarations this is environmental facts so for each ton of uh, product how much primary energy is used how uh, what are the global warming potential acidification and what uh, what are the water consumption per ton? I mean, in actually in uh, in our region, we uh, we have uh, we are water stressed countries. So basically, uh, yeah, global warming potential is is uh, very important. But water consumption per product is also uh, a thing that we need to focus uh, on. So this is uh, how uh, uh, we should look at the EPD. It is. Uh, if I want to reduce the environmental impact, I should I should uh, compare this on the environmental facts. So this is a kind of value created for customers. So the customer can choose. The second thing it is uh, for the company and for the customer. If we have three types of cements, for example, the first one has. Uh, 1,000 kilogram CO2 uh, equivalent per ton, and the, the the least one is 500. Then the customer can choose this one, and well choose this one if it is now if it is competitive in in price. So this will create value for the uh, organization and for the company, as well as value for the uh, customer. So. What about for the society? So if, if we have three producers and the first one is, is now sharing, getting the, the most share of the uh, market, then others will start to uh, make transition to, 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 to have this uh, transition to green. So we will bring the emissions even less so we are providing value epd is is uh, providing value for uh, the society at large so the customer and to the society so uh, again if we are talking about the life cycle assessment we are considering uh, the life cycle uh, along the supply chain so we 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 are calculating the raw material extraction we are calculating manufacturing, transportation, end of life of product. So if we, if we have three products, so how to compare, uh, how to compare them? Basically, um, until now, people are comparing the manufacturing part, but what, what about the, uh, the upstream and the downstream? This is what EPD is, is uh, providing. Then we can make informed decision, decisions based on not only uh, the uh, one impact, but if, if, as I said, if we would like to uh, compare based on water, then we will make the comparison, comparison based on water. If we want to reduce environmental impact and make environmental, uh, uh, improve environment, environmental performance, then we can do that with uh, EPD for different environmental uh, impacts. 
So again, this is uh, here for raw material. It is creating value uh, for uh, suppliers and for stakeholders for the company in, in case of manufacturing. So how to compare uh, the, the product and of course to the customer who can who, who uh, have an infor information to differentiate between the uh, product. So uh, if, if we uh, have production efficiency improvement, then we can uh, have cost savings. We, we uh, have more efficient use of resources. Uh, we can have less waste. And this, is, this also uh, is translated into money. And this is value created yeah, for the environment as well, but this is more important to the organization because the organization, uh, uh, the main uh, target of an organization is to sustain, uh, to sustain environmentally and to sustain economically and socially as we uh, will uh, see. So this, this can be also uh, a way to uh, to show the the sustainability uh, of the company. So if we want to uh, do a sustainability reporting, then we have environmental performance translated by the EPDs uh, economically. Uh, our, uh, we will get more profit than we have economic sustainability and meeting customer needs is a social sustainability. So this is how EPD can be integrated into the business strategy of the uh, company or the organization. So it's, this is value created for, for uh, the company uh, coming from value created for the society and for the uh, environment. And of course, complying to the market requirements. Currently, so many uh, organizations in Europe, North America, uh, actually uh, it is increasing in MENA region uh, to uh, asking for uh, EPDs and uh, of course the leading uh, the leading organization now in in uh, in MENA region for example is the uh, lead for green building market so this is how EPD can make value for uh, our business and for the sustainability of uh, our business so uh, why this is important? Why EPD is important? Because actually most of the successful businesses uh, around the globe are issuing EPDs. We have Simmons in, from Germany and they have provided lots of EPDs for uh, their products that, such as building automations and uh, industrial uh, motors. And this is integrated with uh, net zero carbon footprint strategy so of of Simmons uh, the same for IKEA from Sweden they, they uh, uh, IKEA has integrated EPDs into their product development process so that to reduce uh, uh, emissions and to uh, improve this their sustainability uh, again it is also integrated into uh, their uh, environmental strategy 2030 mm -hmm. uh, nestle they uh, they also uh, produce prod uh, epds for chocolates and uh, coffee and uh, other products this is also related to their uh, carbon footprint and their uh, uh, net zero strategy that they are uh, pursuing now. Uh, the same for uh, L'Oreal Paris. They also have <coughs> provide info. Uh, they they uh, have several products that has uh, EPDs like shampoos and conditioner and and others. Uh, and it is the same. We have uh, a PASF, and they actually. Uh, uh, they also have several uh, uh, EPDs for the coating process, uh, coating uh, materials, plastics and adhesives. And we know that adhesives and the plastics, they have uh, lots of uh, adverse environmental impacts. So it is, it is uh, uh, BASF 
took this uh, EPD to show how their products are uh, trying to uh, to save the in environment. And also, again, it is integrated into their uh, plan to reduce energy, uh, increase energy efficiency, uh, and increase of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, share. Uh, finally, uh, interface uh, from North America, America. So they they ha now have around 90, 99% of their products are uh, uh, having product specific EPDs and again working uh, 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 working to be carbon negative by uh, 2040 and the EPDs is also integrated there. This this uh, journey shows how EPD is uh, is uh, can be integrated and should be integrated into the business strategy of an organization. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I if you have any question, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasa. Do we have any more? I know my colleagues at Harder Work answering questions in the chat. Do you have any more? Uh, live questions that you want to ask Dr. Nasser or Gustav or, or Naylor, our LSA expert. I have a question to Nasser. Yes. Uh, EPD is meant for construction product. Why food industry, a food company or cosmetics company, they are doing EPD? Uh, actually, EPD is not only for construction products. Actually, construction products uh, currently they are uh, leading the market of EPD publications because of the requirements. So, construction uh, sector they are requiring uh, EPDs for uh, green uh, buildings for uh, uh, several uh, building. Uh, a compliance issue in in uh, in different countries, but for food and for other uh, uh, products, no. Actually, EPD is made for all environmental uh, for all products. So for food, for cosmetics, for any type of product, as and services. Actually, actually in EPD International, we have uh, EPD for cleaning services. So if you are providing a cleaning service, then you can issue an EPD of the environmental or and issue an environmental uh, uh, per, uh, product declaration for your services. So it is not only for construction, but for all type of products. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any additional questions? Uh, yes, I think we have a Jean-Pierre. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for the end. Uh, yep, and commission would probably push for their EF method environmental footprint and their uh, PF product environmental footprint communication in the coming ESPR, the, the revision of the eco design revised regulation. Is the EPD system compatible with such PF and PFCR? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Gustav, are you able to answer? Yes, uh, I, I was responding to other questions uh, in parallel, but if I understood <laughs> the question correctly, it was whether our PCRs are aligned with PFCRs. Is that the question? Yeah, and the EF method. EF method, yeah. Uh, no, uh, in general, I mean, in general, EPDs and PEF uh, or EF method are not fully harmonized. Uh, as of the last update of EM15804 released in 2019, more aspects were harmonized. Um, for example, the impact category, more of the impact categories, but there are different characterization factors to be applied for some impact categories, for example. We have different rules on allocation. Uh, as well as data quality, etc. So they are not fully harmonized. When it comes to specific PFCRs, we uh, encourage our PCR developers, the PCR committee and PCR moderator, to harmonize as much as possible if there is an applicable PFCR for the product category. 
So we encourage harmonization and we work in various ways to harmonize more and more, but there are different uh, methods with diverging rules at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think next we have, yes, we have one raised arm. Uh, let me see if I can pronounce it. Shantuan Gaspar. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> I've already uh, raised the question in the chat, but I'm not sure to understand the, the answer. It's about the um, automated configurator of EPD. Is this type of configurator allowed in the uh, EPD international system for the, pro the for the for produce fully automatized and fully verified EPD? Uh, yes, we uh, yeah. As I answered, we allow uh, pre-verified uh, tools. And that is uh, what is meant by that is that you are uh, verifying the tool itself on LCA parts that you typically do on uh, for each EPD. And uh, uh, with this, you can, uh, uh, for example, shorten the verification process for each EPD, or you can also um, skip the whole verification for each EPD and have it as an annual uh, process instead, so you don't have to go verify each if that comes out from the tool. But it really depends on the tool itself and how much what uh, the feature and capabilities of the tool. Um, if you want to skip, if you don't want to have EPDs coming off the tool verified for, uh, for each time, you will need a fully automated tool as required uh, by Echo Platform which is an uh, umbrella organization to, for harmonization of uh, EPD work. OK, 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 thank you. Thank you, Adam. I think we all, Katja, uh, Katja has one more question. I think we're running out of time, so uh, I've made, this may be our last question, but Katja, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I would only like to ask, uh, we are wondering in our company if there is any difference between the EPD done by the Italian or by the Norway certification body. This is something that we are like just curious whether probably standards are the same, but at the same time we are wondering, are there any differences? Uh, Adam, are you, yes? The verification of EPD, or you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, no, they, there shouldn't be any difference. They should uh, work with, uh, they should have the same quality of the verification. Is, is there any oh. reason why you why you wonder or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, when I was browsing through the databases, I actually saw that there are more or less, let's say, uh, some companies more prefer we are working on photo like models and we see that many of our uh, competitors or the companies that are working and um, they are actually certificating their uh, photovoltaic models uh, in um, Italian uh, 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 Italian certification body and I was really wondering whether there are any differences or there are maybe some differences that some markets prefer some other certification or, but probably standards are the same. The the, it, uh, the process uh, the the um, overall process should be the same, but I think but there could also be some that maybe wants to have more on site visits than other. We in our program we don't uh, it's not mandatory on on site visits, but we do recommend it uh, when, for example, um, the majority of the impact comes from the their own core processes. But it's not mandatory. But I also know that uh, the Italian certification body uh, go are now in a transition period. They go from the ISO 7065 to ISO 7029 plus ISO 4065. So they're also doing. Uh, in that sense, it could also maybe. Uh, change a little bit about the procedure, but uh, 
but they all of the security body that are accredited in our program uh, have been uh, approved uh, based on our competence requirements and they and uh, and how they should uh, like operate uh, depending on our GPI and so on. So they they should be should be in the same level in that sense. I hope this okay. clarifies it a bit uh, on your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very no much. Uh, thank you for all the questions. We are now out of time. Um, so if you have any more questions, you can uh, ask them in the chat and we'll get you as soon as possible. You can also email us at our support email, which will be in the chat uh, when this meeting finishes. If you have additional questions or if you have any questions that haven't been answered, you can email them and we'll get them as soon as possible. Um, but thank you for being here uh, at this webinar and hope you have learned something today. Uh, thank you for everybody who's participated and have a very good day. So thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.